Dear students, with this lecture, I continue describing the neural systems. The goal of this lecture is the following. You have a large number of data, which is apparent, sometimes apparently contradictory in your head, uh, and you know quite a lot. In this lecture, I want to highlight some of the details, put them together to make a set, disregarding some non-important details. You give an impression how things work. I give you a kind of system, overview of system, what you can use in your later profession. In the previous lecture, I described the autonomic nervous system. Today, in this lecture, the topic will be the motoric control, how we control our skeletal muscle. To understand just a kind of introduction, a repetition on the neural control, the uh, goal of the neural reg regulation is to respond to the environment, see what's happening there, and we do a response in a way that apparently, hopefully, the most useful for us in the near and far future. The element of this one, first of all, we have to get information from the environment, uh, the receptors doing this job. This information should be carried into the central processing system. These are the afferent or sensory pathway. This can be used as synonyms. Then we have a central processing unit. This is our brain. Uh, then whenever they decide to react to the environment, we give off information. This is the efferent or motoric information. We name motoric even if it's not contraction. Uh, for instance, the visceral motoric is also there. Uh, this can be somatic, what we can do voluntarily and autonomic, which is done involuntarily. And we have effectors, those tissues which we can uh, control uh, uh, by our nervous system. We have a large number of tissues, and also philosophically it might be interesting that only three type of tissues we can control directly by the uh, uh, central nervous system. This is the skeletal muscles, the glands, and the smooth muscle. Even more restrictive that with voluntarily only the skeletal muscle can be controlled. Very large number of human activity is all of them based on the contraction of skeletal muscle. The afferent or sensory system uh, uh, is made of the somatosensory system in which we feel uh, the system. The somatosensory means that we are aware of this information. And autonomic sensory, we do not aware of the fact, but the information is present in our uh, central nervous system just to support the homeostasis. The efferent of the motoric system also we have it two ways. We have somatomotoric, which we can voluntarily do, and only one tissue, the skeletal muscle can do that. And this can be done in two major ways. We have a direct control between the cortex and the muscle with one or two synapses only. So we are lord of every single muscle fibers. This is what we named the pyramidal system. And we have a servo system in which we just have to think about everyday thing. I lift my arm, walk, talk, and whatever. And the details, which muscle should be contracted in which moment, is done by a very complex system, the so-called extrapyramidal system. This system is practically involves about two-thirds of our brain, so it's a very huge, sophisticated system. Uh, the other uh, type of efferent systems are the autonomic or visceral motoric system, which is involuntary. Uh, typically, anatomically, as a ganglion, a peripheral nerve cells is involved in the efferent part. And we can control two types of tissues, glands and smooth muscle. Uh, these are divided to sympathetic, parasympathetic, enteral. And this was described in details in the previous lecture. Today, I will talk about the somatomotoric system. To understand what the somatomotoric system, what is the function, uh, the moving of the somatomotoric system is, we, uh, let me briefly describe what we use our cerebral cortex for. We can divide the cortex into two major functional areas, the sensory cortex, which consists of the parietal, the occipital, and the temporal lobes. And these uh, were processing various sensory information. Uh, whatever information comes out through the receptors, through the sensory organs to that, we analyze. We try to um, uh, compose from dots a picture, 
uh, and the, we compare this picture to the, our memories. And this is how we can recognize, oh, this is my girlfriend, or this is a, a piece of computer or whatever in front of me. And this piece of information, which is useful for us in everyday life. Similarly, from the apparently random noise, we can screen out uh, uh, words or music, understand speaking, and so on. So the, uh, through various organs, uh, these lobes, we get a very delicate information on the environment. We compare the memory and identify things. In contrast, we have the botary cortex, which is only the frontal lobe, and this is the uh, lobe of the response. With this lobe, we can respond to the environment. Getting information from the sensory lobe, this will uh, uh, prepare the response. First of all, get the information from the different uh, sensory lobes, compare the, the previous experiences, it's already get complex information, a certain person, a certain sentence meaning, and so on. And this is compared to the previous experience. If you analyze, if you reacted this way, it was good for us. If you reacted that way, it was bad for us. So we select whatever is going to be best for us. So we decide how to respond. Uh, then whenever we decide it, we initiate the movement. And also it controls, not only initiates, it just follows these movements uh, during the way. Uh, between the brain and the skeletal muscle, there is a three regulatory pathways, three connections. One of them is a direct, the pyramidal system. The other one is the a servo mechanism, the extrabrainal system, in which we have think about simple, uh, straightforward, everyday movement, and it will translate to the language of the muscle. And finally, we will uh, also inform uh, information from the brains, how active the environment is, will uh, control the general muscle tension. Let me spend a few words on the reticular formation. Uh, you get a lot of details uh, on the lectures on that. Uh, it is, uh, all of these details uh, sometimes can be too crowded, too many. Let me very simplify what is the function of that. Uh, the reticular formation is one of the most ancient type of our brain. Those creatures who had uh, a certain group of neurons, which is over the spinal cord, which was the original central nervous system. This was the reticular formation. This is the remnant. A uh, lot of other things added to that, but the reticular formation is the most ancient uh, neural group in our brain. This is a very diffuse network. We do not have, or maybe we can identify, but not uh, necessarily, uh, nuclei. This diffuse system is connected to everything. It is uh, aware of any kind of information, what ar arrives at pain, visual information, acoustic information, movement, pressure, and whatever. And it's not really interested in details. The only thing the system is interested in, whether the environment is active, so we can have a good chance to have something, some reaction. So we have to be aware, because you have to watch out because something will happen, or it's very boring, very dull, no hope to something happens. And in this case, the, it deactivates the system. So the output is to a kind of diffuse activation, inactivation. Whenever something happens in the environment, it activates diffusely the cortex, so we are much more eager to see and we, we watch out practically, and also the muscles. Uh, the muscles uh, is, is a continuous contraction of muscle fibers, so we have a certain tone of the muscle. Whenever the environment is active, we can say especially when we are nervous, uh, the muscle tone is very big. The advantage of this one, we can easier and quicker jump. Whenever the environment is dull, we have no chance to react. With very, very little probability we have to react quick. In this case, the system turns to be the green stage, an energy saving stage, or the, uh, actually the idle speed of the muscle, similar to the card is low, uh, the, the brain is getting low, we can like, get, it, get a little bit drowsy and so on. It's saving energy and making the uh, organs rest. So this is a kind of, uh, this reticular formation, this is an ancient type 
of a thing which generally, it doesn't matter whether it's seeing something or hearing something, something happening in the environment or it's very dull and boring. Okay, now, uh, let's about the reticular formation. Let's see the, the other two other things. The pyramidal system, we, uh, what, uh, what I, uh, how I mentioned, we have a direct control, uh, almost direct control to the uh, skeletal muscle from the cortex. And this is, makes a kind of uh, power of, on every single muscle fibers. Every single muscle fibers we can contract voluntarily. Uh, the cortical center of this one, which has point-to-point -point mapping to the muscle fibers, is the precentral glenerus, the posterior most part of the frontal lobe. You studied in details that the somatotopy is that the head is in the lateral side and in the medial side, the tail part of the body. Uh, the fibers run down and in the kinderic capsule, they take the knee. The anterior part is, in this case, the somatotopy, is uh, uh, the in front and the lower part of the body is in the back. Uh, the anterior, the upper part of the body is controlled by the motoric nuclei of the brainstem. And in this picture, the red and the or orange nuclei uh, are that. Hopefully you identify them. Uh, the uh, other muscles, which are controlled by spinal nerves, uh, they go down to the spinal cord, and this is this part of the tracheal corticospinal. The cortic nuclei and the corticospinal tracts together be named the pyramidal pathway. Uh, in the, if we go further more down in the mesencephalon, it's in the pedunculus cerebri, and it is in the middle. Uh, this is between the Arnold and the Turk pathways, of which I talk about soon. And it's also the sconotopy turned the head in the medial side of this pathway. In the pons, which looks like a swamp with a lot of uh, 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 objects around that, so we have to turn around many, many things. These are the pointine nuclei, and the pyramidal pathway is spread between these nuclei. It has not uh, uh, specific somatotopy. In the medulla oblongata, also they collected and make a pathway just in the ventral side of the medulla oblongata. This is what we named the pyramid. The name came after the fact that the upper part is wider. As you go low, it becomes narrower and narrower. It's like a kind of elongated pyramid system. By the way, the whole pathway named after, get the name after that, not like some book says the pyramidal cells. It was named pyramidal pathway long before the pyramidal cells were discovered. Uh, the reason why it's getting uh, narrower is that many of the fibers are crossing and going to the dorsal side, the opposite dorsal side. So whatever stay here become less, fewer and fewer. Uh, in the spinal cord, uh, consequently, we have two ways the pyramidal tract goes, the non-crossed uh, or direct uh, pathway, which is the most medial part of the anterior funiculus. This pathway is uh, 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 controls the ancient muscles, the trunk muscles. So those muscles are controlled by these pathways, which is present in the most primitive vertebrates, like fish. Fish do not have limbs. They uh, swim and do everything with the muscles of the trunk. They have practically only this type of uh, uh, direct pyramidal pathway. These pathways, importantly, is crossing also, but here, not at the level of the medulla oblongata, and usually, usually through a switching neuron, it uh, uh, acts, uh, ends on the motor neuron, which directly go all the way down to the muscle fibers. And the uh, crossed pyramidal pathway, which is crossed at the level of the medulla oblongata, goes in the dorsal side of the lateral funiculus, this green area. Uh, this controls those uh, muscles which are in the limbs, especially the, uh, doing the five movements. Uh, some of these fibers can directly end on the motor neurons, but most of them through switching neurons. So this is the pyramidal pathway, uh, whatever we have control on all the muscles. Important thing to know is, if we use this pathway, it's very tiring. Why? Doesn't matter who, who said what, we can concentrate at the time on one thing. Everything which is happening on the cortex, we are aware of. So and we, have, we can do one thing at a time. So if you do a movement, let me say if you walk, and we use pyramidal pathway, 
We have to invent the contraction of every muscle. We cannot do anything else, just concentrate on, uh, on this particular muscle. Luckily enough, uh, we don't, uh, don't have to do that. So uh, after beyond the age of six or so, we very rarely use the, into our everyday life the pyramidal pathways, which is very tiring. Instead, we use the extrapyramidal system. So what is the role? Important thing to know is purely voluntary. Nothing happens in this system what we don't want to. Import, uh, the only thing is that the details we don't have to think about, we don't have to design, but the whole process we initiate, we can stop it any time, we can modify it any time, so everything is voluntarily initiated, so it's a voluntary system. The, uh, what kind of steps? Just uh, first, we give a brief summary how this system works. First of all, we have to decide what to do. The same thing in a frontal lobe. It happens that uh, this is uh, actually the way which uh, sends the information down to the subcortical system to carry out the details of this activity is in the Brodmann area number six, in the premotor area. Some of the uh, physiologists say prefrontal area, which is stupid, but prefrontal areas in front of the frontal lobe in the air. So this is, uh, you better say, it's premotoric area. Uh, the, after uh, the, uh, we know what to do, after it's sent down to the system, first you have to get a, a movement pattern store. So the, the information which goes down is that I want to lift my hand. It doesn't tell anything about the muscles or contraction, the timing of that, just an everyday way of movement. Here we have and the cerebellum, nothing else, just a big movement pattern store. So whatever is the input in a real life movement, and what is the output is a very well designed muscle uh, contraction pattern. So uh, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, this is uh, what, what we, this is a kind of central structure of this whole system. Uh, we never do the. Uh, uh, any movement twice at the very same time at the time because we have to uh, contract the muscle a little bit different right? if you carry a bag or if you go a little bit uphill even although the basic pattern is the same but we have to slightly modify the movement based on the environment so we have to get feedback to adapt to the actual the, the environment <coughs> and many many inf information should be improved. <coughs> Finally at the end of this one, we just have an information, a very clear information, that this, this particular moment, which muscle must be contracted with which force. Now it comes a large number of nerve cells, which uh, actually distributing the task. Which muscle fibers at that particular moment has to carry out this wished movement? And this is that. This includes the basal ganglia and the um, that part of the thalamus. Finally, the output is identical to that of the pyramidal pathway, the motoric nuclei of the brainstem and the spinal cord. After this uh, general overview, let me see, talk about some details of that. So once again, we start with the planning. The planning and decision happens in the frontal lobe, independent of what is the real output of the system. The initiation is in the real life, the first thing what we do, let me say we decided to walk to the door, we send the information to the pre-motoric area, Bronman area number six, and see whether we did this type of movement before. If we did, and after a year of five, six, we have a very good chance we did it. We send it down to the system, and the cortex doesn't have to mind this movement anymore. I walk to the door, without any further cortical control. So even a complex movement, go home, you walk home during a pavement, we can do that, we avoid people, we can step up and down on a curve, and meanwhile, we don't have to think about muscle control, we can plan our dates, or what we'll do uh, in the evening, or uh, try to uh, recall our memories on the lectures, and so on, and so on. How this, how this system works. First of all, we have to give a comment what we want to do, and this comment channel is the frontopontine pathway. This is a pathway which runs 
in the mesenchymal phalon medially from the pyramidal pathway in the pedunculus cerebri. This pathway ends up in the pontine nuclei, and the pontine nuclei, which is pro further processing this information, will find the appropriate point of the cerebellum uh, where we want to do. Uh, the information from the pontine nuclei go to the pontal cerebellar tract, this is a middle uh, cerebellar pedunculus, and they arrive at the opposite hemisphere because it's a crossed pathway. Uh, it's important to mention that the cortex always controls the muscles in the opposite side of the body. This crossing happens in case of the pyramidal pathway either at the medulla oblongata level or at the spinal cord level as I described before. For the extrabidal system it happens here in the pontine nuclei. In the muscles are controlled by the identical hemispheres of the cerebellum after that, so everything is straightforward connected, no further crossing is system happens. Uh, this movement pattern stone is a cerebellum. <clears throat> uh, whatever you have to know is practically this is a kind of infrastructure, hardware, which comes empty when we are born and we have to fill up with programs during our life. Whenever, for instance, the baby is lying in the cradle and moves the head, this is apparently does nothing, but it's a very important learning movement. It just happened to think about something and the head moves this way. Oh, what's happening? I try to repeat this way of thinking and I do that repeatedly. And when I like it, it stored this movement pattern in the cerebellum and next time I can voluntarily the turning my hand, uh, this one. This happens with the more complex thing, sitting up, standing up, walking, and do any kind of complicated thing, uh, things like writing, talking, and whatever. So uh, this is, uh, the task of this cerebellum is make a translation between the real world wish. So here in this pathway, a real world wish comes down, walking, standing up, talking, writing, whatever, and in this uh, cerebellum describe the program for that wish movement, a contra uh, con uh, contraction of which muscle at which very given sequence uh, should be done to carry out properly. Uh, however, as I mentioned, we do not do the same movement twice, e very e uh, identically. Uh, consequently, we have to slightly modify. The basic pattern doesn't change, whatever is stored is not un uh, altered. However, uh, we can have to modify. Once, uh, as I mentioned, carrying bird are stronger, we have a big coat on them, uh, the wind want to push out and so on, so we have to compensate all of this for. How these feedbacks come? Uh, so this is a kind of modification of the store movement pattern to fit the actual environment. Okay, what is involved in? First of all, all three sensory lobes were there. For instance, let's imagine that uh, the task of this extrapedal system, I gave the command to walk home or walk along this uh, pavement. If somebody comes against me, I do not have to Cortically think, oh, whether I hit him or go to the right and left side, it's done automatically by the system in the best uh, possible way. Uh, for that, we need a very delicate picture analysis, which is available only in the occipital lobe. Similarly, if somebody cried out, cry out, we have to analyze the word, have to know what's, what kind of uh, verbal information we get, and this is what it gets down. Also, the somatosensory information. If we lift up, out, up our hand and suddenly the temperature increases, we immediately stop it for preventing being burned. All of this information from the sensory lobe come down for the common pathway. It has a, a complex, complex name, temporoparieto occipital pontine tract. If you don't want to break your tongue, you say Turk pathway. This was the describer. And this goes the very same way as the frontopontine pathway ends on the same nucleus, the pontine nuclei, just runs in the lateral side of the pedunculus cerebri in the mesencephalon. The following pathway is also identical to that of the Arnold pathway. It goes to the opposite hemisphere to the pontocerebellar pathway through the middle cerebellar pedunculus. Uh, additional information, which is very necessary and very useful when we do any kind of movements, we're doing usually most of the movements are not done by lying on the ground, but in a standing or uh, some, somehow, at least uh, 
slightly vertical position and we do be in balance and the vestibular nuclei gets this information. The, uh, from, uh, as you know, we have four vestibular nuclei, the borderline of the pons and medulla oblongata, and the superior, the medial, the inferior, and the lateral. The first three of them have direct connection with the uh, balance receptors, the macula and the crystals, and they screen out very accurate information, what is the current position of the head and which way I am just keep moving. Uh, then this information is given over to the lateral one. This is a kind of communicator nucleus of that. And this has connection to the outside world, uh, like the cerebellum, like the spinal cord, and whatever. Uh, the the uh, connection between the lateral vestibular nuclei, which is goes to the cerebellum, is named the vestibular cerebral tract. And some science says that from the, the, uh, some from the cortex, uh, the cerebellar cortex, also there is a pathway back. Uh, we do not really know not exactly now. We just have some idea what uh, the background is, but some people describe that. Uh, we have very important information on the state of the muscle. What does it mean? Uh, the whole system, the output of the whole system is nothing else, just neural impulses and the muscle can react to impulses different way. If the muscle is tired, it has low level of oxygen, like for instance after a nice disco next morning, it reacts much slower. If it's uh, it is, uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, it's not tired, it's, it's very vivid, then it reacts sometimes overreacting things. So the cerebellum has to get a feedback. What really happened in the muscle and the contractional muscles are measured by the muscle and tendon spindles. And this information goes back through the spinal cerebellar tract, the anterior and the posterior one, through the cerebellum. And this is a kind of control. What was the real result of the impulses I sent out? Uh, uh, finally, we have a connection with the reticular uh, formation. As you know, the reticular formation is uh, responsible for the muscle tone. So if you want to compare to the car, it's an idle speed. If I have a high engine uh, uh, speed before we start the car, it jumps very quickly. If it's a low, we have to push the pedal just to accelerate that. So the cerebellum must know what is the current state of the muscle, and based on that, give a little bit more or less impulse for the muscle to contract in a wished way. So, up to this point, we already have the information which muscle at this particular moment has to contract with which force. Let me say my biceps must uh, contract with 7.5 Newton force. Uh, uh, how these things uh, uh, will be get reality? Uh, the uh, output of the cerebellar cortex, output tests, are the Purkinje cells. The exon the Purkinje cells end up in the pontine nuclei, and uh, 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 the biggest of them is the dentate nuclei, but the other nuclei behave uh, uh, similarly. And the pathway from this dentate nuclei through the superior cerebellar pedunculus ends up in two nuclei, the red nucleus, nucleus ruber, and the, th uh, the uh, extrapyrinal nuclei of the thalamus, these are ventral anterior and the ventral lateral nuclei. The thalamus is practically a big series of sensory nuclei. Most of the nuclei, vast majority of the nuclei, processing sensory information. We have two, uh, uh, how to say, renegades. One of them, the ventral anterior and the ventral lateral nuclei. These are part of the extramural system, uh, working with moving control. And the pulvinar, which has cortico-cortical connection, which has nothing to do with the sensory. The rest of them are sensory. <coughs> the, the red nucleus is located in the borderline between, well, actually it's a mesencephalon, and you can see this is a brain slice, the mesencephalon. You can see the substantia nigra, and above that we have two relatively big, nice, uh, well visible nuclei. This is the red nucleus, the nucleus ruber. Uh, okay, now we have the information which went out of the cerebellum, reached these two nuclei. We still have a problem how this information that 
with I have to contract my bicep with 7 newton will be translated into the language of the muscle fibers. We meet two problems. One of the problems is the muscle fibers is that the muscle fibers cannot contract a little or more, either force, force or nothing. So it's everything or nothing uh, should contract. The way we can uh, uh, express different forces with the muscle is based on how many muscle fibers at a certain moment contract. The number of the contracted muscle fibers and not the force of the individual muscle fibers that concerns. The other problem is that the muscle fibers can work very uh, short time, a fraction of a second. After that, it becomes tires and have to replace by the other uh, muscle fibers. So we have to get a very complicated system with a very high computing power to figure out that which muscle fibers at this particular moment should contract. Uh, this uh, system must know every single muscle fibers by person. You have to know that whether this muscle fibers is, uh, uh, has had a rest or it's already uh, tired and it cannot be really worked with, and select out the appropriate muscle fibers and the number of muscle fibers to contract. Let me say we have a couple of million muscle fibers in the biceps, and for this particular moment, the system figure out we need 1,700 dead and dead muscle fibers. The system must select out those muscle fibers who are in a good condition in this particular, particular tenth of a second, and they make them work and start calculating the next uh, fraction of a second, which muscle fibers can contract. This very rapid changing of the muscle fibers, you can hear with the electromyography, if you will uh, get into this uh, information. So uh, the uh, output is, uh, the, the origin of this task distribution is the thalamus, and the uh, the, actually, the work is done by a group of nuclei named basal ganglia. It's a very large number of neurons. They consist of the striatum, the caudate nucleus and the portamen, the nucleus accubens, the uh, subthalamic nuclei, the Lewy nuclei, and the substantia nigra. And these are processing. So the task of the nuclei is to translate the wished contraction of movement to actual control of a certain muscle fiber. Uh, details you already heard in the previous lecture, but that's the most important thing of that. Uh, uh, to uh, carry out the task in a proper way, we need additional things, internal feedback of the system. How it happens? One of them is the inferior olive, of, of which I uh, haven't talked about yet. This is a very important component of the system, but it's not directly connected to any of the raw information. The only information it gets is the output of the cerebellum. So the uh, cerebellar nuclei send out information for the red nucleus and the uh, 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 thalamus, the extracellular nuclei of the thalamus. And there is a very nice uh, pathway from these two nuclei to the inferior olive, the uh, central tegmental fasciculus. And this is the primary input of this nuclei. It also has uh, from the anterior spinal cerebellar tract, but these are the inputs. Practically, this nucleus has very well processed information, very reliable information, because it's already beyond large number of uh, control. And this is why its output, the olivocerebellar pathway, is very powerful. As you know, all the other pathways except for that arrive at mossy fibers that will continue with the parallel fibers and at approximately two, five thousand parallel fibers have to talk at a certain short period of time to have a response from the Purkinian cells. In contrast, the, uh, the olivocerebellar pathways, which ended climbing fibers, not mossy fibers, not parallel contracts, one single fiber can modify the function of the Purkinje cells. And this is uh, uh, actually can be considered as a last outdoor control. If something still has problems, it is a fine last final adjustment. 
Okay, uh, also we have a couple of feedbacks inside the basal ganglia. The most uh, best known is the ansa lenticularis between the lentiform nucleus and the thalamus and so on. But the same ansa loops is a bit, uh, involves the ansa uh, the uh, nucleus subthalamicus and also the substantia nigra of that. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the feedback loops between the thalamus and the basal ganglia. On the cortex also involved, not only as conventional and the primary uh, external feedback, but also in this mechanism, all of the lobes have some fibers sent to the uh, basal nuclei, and all, it has a reciprocal feedback, uh, a backward feedback, from the uh, extrapinal nuclei of the thalamus. It goes back to the frontal lobe, informing it how things are going on. Finally, the output. We have two output nuclei of this system, the red nucleus, nucleus ruber, and the inferior olive. The pathway from the red nucleus is the rubrospinal pathway, which is in front of the crossed uh, pyramidal pathway. Actually, this is the pathway used much more frequently than the adult uh, compared to the pyramidal pathway. And the olivospinal uh, pathway is running in the lateral part of the anterior uh, funiculus. What is the difference between the functions of these two nuclei? We do not have exact and generally accepted information, but the uh, important thing is they, these are the two major outputs of this primary control, the practical primary controller of the skeletal muscles, and through switching neurons, they end up on the same uh, motoric nuclei as the pyramidal pathway, both in the brainstem and the, in the spinal cord. Uh, in this picture, I want to show you a summary of this system. Uh, you can uh, see it from, uh, I uploaded of course, my uh, lecture documents to the internet site, so you can see and study it. Even I have a little animation in which you can see dynamically a couple of feedback loops uh, which going on in this system. Even although this picture looks complicated, but hopefully when you study all the details, everything, everything will be familiar for you. <coughs> However, the story has not ended yet. Whatever I described, it was the backbone of the extrapinal system. And there are a couple of uh, side uh, mechanisms, which is very useful for that. It modifies the movement, uh, the voluntary movement, corrects it whenever it, something gets uh, further wrong. Uh, these pathways are the following. The accessory uh, pathways are the reticulospinal pathways from which comes the reticular formation. And as you know, this is uh, the pathway for the muscle tone. Uh, the vestibulospinal comes from the lateral vestibular nuclei. As you know, it's the main output of the vestibular system. And this is for the balance. So if during this very carefully carried out movement, something still happening, like I misstepped uh, or somebody pushed me, uh, it, this uh, uh, cyst, which is, was not involved in the original processing, uh, this system will compensate for him and prevents me from falling out or losing my balance. Uh, the tectospinal pathway is comes from the tectum, especially from the superior colliculus. Superior colliculus is a very interesting nucleus. In all of the non-mammalian vertebrae, this is the highermost center of the visual system. Uh, the crocodiles, frogs, and even chicken or birds see with that. For instance, if you disassemble a head of a chicken, almost half of the head, half of the brain is superior colliculus because the birds see very well. Uh, in uh, he, uh, mammals, the primary visual center moved to the cortex. The new achievement, you know, the cort cortex is present only in the mammalian animals, the occipital lobe. Uh, in non-mammalian animals, the visual pathway is the retina, lateral geniculate body, superior colliculus. That's it. In a human, the main pathway is retina, lateral geniculate body, and the occipital lobe. But the superior colliculus still had a connection with the lateral geniculate body, and it get a, a, a relatively well, but a fast processed information. <clears throat> What we can do with this one, it works in a very simple principle. If in our viewing area, small subject suddenly move, we automatically catch it. You save a lot of belongings on that, 
fell down, you caught it, and just uh, you, what happened? I didn't really realize that I already got it. Probably everybody has this experience. This is due to this uh, 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 olivo uh, uh, tactospinal pathway. The other uh, uh, mechanism of this pathway, if something big coming against us, we uh, go away because it can hit us. So small objects we catch, large objects we yield. Uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus is even more interesting. <clears throat> this pathway, which goes all along the uh, brainstem and the spinal cord, practically works for the visual, for the sharp seeing. How it happens? If you want to study something, we have to ha get, have to get a picture on, of this particular object to the sharp viewing area, the macula uh, fovea, and then the, the facula lutea. And this uh, uh, make, must make sure that it stays there, because otherwise we can't. Do. However, the target can move, our head can move, we're always moving a little bit, body, head, and whatever, and we can lose this picture. And the very complex system is taking care of that, that the eye always see whatever we want to see. Uh, uh, to uh, get the system to work, this far best get information from two pathways. One, analyzing the shift of the picture. The sh picture shift is, is uh, uh, initiated by two nuclei. This is the uppermost point, by the way, of this pathway. The interstitial nucleus named Kachal and the nucleus commissary post is Darkshevich. These two nuclei situated between the diencephalon and the mesencephalon in a so-called nobody's land. And these, they have connections from the lateral geniculate body. And the only thing they take care of is whether the picture, the whole picture moved. They don't interest in the details. Just analyze whether the whole picture moves somewhere or stayed. If it moves, they send out a kind of compensatory information to the muscle to move the eye accordingly back to see the original picture. The other one is uh, the uh, head, uh, vestibular, uh, vestibular, lateral vestibular nucleus, which is uh, uh, actually feeling the head movement. It has a very important, and importantly, much quicker than the uh, picture analysis. It's much more simple to process it, and very powerful. Most of the time, whenever we move, uh, the, uh, it controls the system that doesn't matter what we move, the eye still seeing the same thing. We compensate with the eye moving muscle, the head moving muscle, and so on. So the output of the, all the muscles, which has something to do with the position of the eye, the eye moving muscle is natural, the head moving muscle, two important muscles move the head, the standard muscle is in the trapezic muscle. With this muscle, we put the head in any position, and the accessory nerve doesn't do anything else, just move the head, and partially, it feeds, controls the, the sharp seeing. And finally, the trunk, if the object moves a large way, we can also turn the trunk. Probably you're familiar with movement if the, on the street some interesting thing along, uh, moves beside you. Here you can see a picture in which the chicken, which also has this medial longitudinal fasciculus, how it works well. If I move the body of a chicken, uh, the uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus compensates for him, and the head always stays in a picture. A very slight movement to the head with a quick vestibular nuclei, it will compensate for, move the muscle in a way that the head doesn't move. And this is the very same mechanism as the people's medial longitudinal fasciculus works, but it's much easier to show in a bird, and hopefully you get a very nice impression. Finally, if something can go wrong, will go wrong, as uh, <laughs> these stories say. Let's see what are the malfunction of the system. Unfortunately, the system is so complicated, we don't know very much of the details. Uh, usually, the problems is medical oriented. We have the symptoms and try to figure out more or less success that what is the mechanism, what kind of mechanism beside that. So the problems with the extraplanar system are divided based on the, the symptoms. Uh, dyskinesia is a group of symptoms which has a, such a uh, problem with the movement. We want to do a movement. It's carried out more or less, but not the way we wish so. Uh, so this is the 
co uh, basal fiber coordination problem. Hypotonia it means that the muscles are much lower tones, so it's very difficult to move. Ataxia it means it's very un uncertain of movement. Dysmetria it move longer or shorter than expect. This is what the teenagers do when they uh, uh, grow up. And asynergy, we I do with different force, whatever we want to do the movement. Uh, interesting thing, the on-off syndrome, especially with the uh, uh, the substantia nigra, if you have problems with that, we start moving and suddenly stop. We cannot move further on, doesn't matter what we want to. We got frozen. Then at a certain time, it, we still can uh, working on. And this is uh, what the on-off syndrome, uh, probably this is the diffuse uh, dying out of substantia nigra. And the leftover cells are overburdened. And they said, I work enough, let's stop it. And when they recovered, they just continue the control of the movement. And the catatonia is a kind of movement in which you can grasp. If you hold, if you get the hand, very difficult to hold it. If you move the any part of the body, they will be suspended in a certain position. It cannot help. It's become frozen, sustained in an optimal position. This is what we name the catatonia. Uh, the second group is the involuntary movement. We do not want to do anything, but our muscles move. Uh, uh, this is the tremor, whatever we say. Uh, this poor uh, uh, rat was poisoned and make the, uh, the substantia nigra uh, was damaged, this move we say. So the principle of this, if I hold my hand this way, it's apparently in a steady state. Practically, it moves a little bit up and down with compensatory movement, but the amplitude is so little, I cannot notice it. If you are damaged with substantia nigra, it takes a time, a movement, until the system notices something wrong and suddenly gets it back. Then it's overdoing it, suddenly gets it back, and so, so it's a kind of movement, the stability control. Atetosis, this poor guy doesn't want to do anything. But automatically, with a low, worm-like movement, the hand on any other part of the body moves. This is what we named atetosis. Uh, the third, uh, next one is the chorea, in which we have involuntary movement. Sometimes, uh, every now and then, one of the parts is moving. This boy wants to uh, lie still. Also, when he's walking, sudden movement back uh, disturbing him. Uh, it has uh, a different type of neurotransmitters difference. So the neurotransmitters is, uh, well, it's present in every part of the brain. It's uh, not really useful, but we can use for something. For instance, the Huntington cornea has this type of uh, differences in uh, neurotransmitter problem. Balismus is a sudden involuntary movement. Also, this poor girl wants to lie stable. But automatically, the hand and the foot making like sudden big movement. This is what we name the balismus, and usually the subthalamic nuclei lesion will uh, has a consequence of that. The Parkinson's disease is very frequent, comes from many things together. Bradykinesia, it can move slowly. Rigidity, you can see the face, the muscles of the face doesn't move. It has a, like as if it were paralyzed. The tremor, I showed before, instability, and the Cogville syndrome the on, uh, is uh, also uh, showing that. So if I want to move my head, is I move continuously, but in this way, move a little fraction. This is like a Cogville. Uh, this is the uh, problem usually with the substantia nigra and dopaminergic neural regions. And this is what I wanted to talk about today. Thank you very much for your attention.